Because you listen to this show, I'm going to assume that, like me, you're a person who's fascinated by scientific and philosophical questions. So I wanted to tell you about another show I've discovered recently, the addictive, eye-opening, mind-bending podcast series, The End of the World with Josh Clark. Josh Clark is co-host of the absorbing Stuff You Should Know podcast. And for The End of the World, he dives into existential risks, ways we humans might accidentally wipe ourselves out with the same technology we're developing now in the hope that it will make a bright future for us. For example, how a haphazard physics experiment could end the universe, or why artificial intelligence could take control of the world, or how an artificially mutated virus could escape a lab and create a global pandemic. This is serious stuff for sure, but the end of the world delivers the fascinating science behind existential risks through an immersive experience with a beautiful original score and cinematic sound design that takes you from a spacecraft trying to navigate interstellar space to deep inside your body to the far future where humans have evolved into a post-biological species who live in digital form. The End of the World with Josh Clark is waiting to take you on an adventure. You can find it on Apple Podcasts, the iHeartRadio app, or wherever you get your podcasts. Why not listen to all 10 episodes now and join the conversation on social media with hashtag EOTW Josh Clark. Welcome to Future Makers, your invitation to cutting edge debates on our changing society with leading researchers at the University of Oxford recorded here in the Thomas Hobbs Room at Hartford College. I'm Peter Milliken, Professor of Philosophy, and our first series is all about artificial intelligence. With AI algorithms now able to mine enormous databases, assimilate information and learn from it far quicker than humans can, we're able to identify subtle effects in health data that could otherwise have been easily overlooked so how are these tools being developed and used? What does this mean for medical professionals and patients? And how do we decide whether these algorithms are making things better or worse? With me to discuss this today are Alison Noble, Technikos Professor of Biomedical Engineering in the Department of Engineering Science. Paul Leeson, a professor of cardiovascular medicine who is head of the Oxford Cardiovascular Clinical Research Facility and is also a consultant cardiologist at the John Radcliffe Hospital. And Jess Morley, a technology advisor to the Department of Health and Social Care, leading on policy relating to the Prime Minister's artificial intelligence mission. Welcome to you all and thank you for coming. Thank you. Alison, can you give us the perspective from someone who's researching the AI techniques that are feeding into clinical practice? So I'm an engineer, um, background in image analysis. And if I look how image analysis as, a, as an area has changed, it's been dramatic over the last 20 years. Um, image analysis is generally about taking images and extracting useful information as a general concept. Um, so 30 years, that meant you'd be taking some video and you'd be digitizing, you'd have very small data sets, and then you would process on computers quite slowly. So the rate at which you could recover information was quite slow. It could take a few hours. And it's really underpinning the transformation that's led to our current era of thinking about artificial intelligence is the fact we, we have a lot of digital data. And with digital data, as we build up large databases of information, the question really is, what can you do with that? And when people talk about artificial intelligence in, in my world, it means using uh, machine learning algorithms, so optimization methods that can take the data and try and extract information, um, often in, in a lot better way, which is why there's interest in, in medicine. It's more, more accurate methods and more repeatable methods. And that's really opened up everyone's mind as to how we can use large data sets about medical information in quite different ways. When you learn from the data, you need to know, presumably, what the correct answer is to any particular question you're asking in order to train the machine to recognise genuine cases. Is that right? You're, you're feeding in lots and lots of information and then you're telling the machine 
these are the positive cases, these are the negative cases, and it's finding rules that will reliably identify those. Is, is that yeah? In that, that it, it is actually one class of of method, but and they're called supervised methods, and those are the ones that we work with. And what we're really trying to do is take examples from. In my case, I work with ultrasound images, and with ultrasound images, um, you have very um, repeatable patterns. And those are quite difficult for experts to learn to interpret. So the idea in machine learning is it's all about pattern recognition. So if you can use the concepts of pattern recognition, which you learn what are the important patterns from looking at a large number of examples, you can use that as a base of trying to interpret um, the useful information in images. How do you know which are the important patterns? Is it the human expert judgment that's feeding in there? Yes, it is. It's very much that. So if you like the art or alternatively the skill in getting good models that are built with machine learning is to think carefully about what we call it training data, careful about the data you put in, because whatever data you put into one of the algorithms, you can only model from the examples, the algorithms or the software seen. Okay, so you you hope that the system will learn to identify cases where perhaps the signals are far more subtle and many humans might miss them, but they're identifying the same kinds of patterns as the human expert identifies. Well, as a as an engineer, you you will be using that assumption that if you've got data that has certain patterns, the algorithm will train on that and learn the patterns. What's quite exciting though is that you do find in some cases the computer will find other patterns and other relationships. When people talk about algorithms being better than humans, it's because humans have don't recognize the patterns and the computers do. Um, we have an example from our, our own research where we were looking at um, fetal ultrasound. So we were scanning fetuses and estimating the um, number of weeks pregnancy from looking at the the, uh, images from the the brain. And these are really quite subtle patterns. Humans can't determine the age by looking at scans um, and looking at the internal structures of the brain. But we could train an algorithm to learn what the patterns were. So I think there are, there are certain areas where the hidden patterns that the human visual system is incapable of finding, um, computers can actually um, recognise those patterns and you can put those to use. Right. Presumably there, you do have hard information about the actual age of the fetus. Exactly. You know that by, by some other information. So you have a database in which you can associate the true age with the image and you learn essentially a mapping between the two. Might there be cases where you would want to feed back information, for example, let's take the case of ultrasound, from later in the pregnancy? So, for example, it might turn out that there's some pattern which you can identify fairly early on, but then you find out later is correlated with certain good or bad outcomes later in the pregnancy. Um, is that a possibility? Is that happening? Today, we don't know how to do that, but exactly those sorts of questions are the research, the academic questions that are people starting to do. And why, why the time is right to do that today is because of the availability of data. As an engineer, I don't solve those problems on my own. This is where the interdisciplinary aspect works of working with people like Paul, and in my case, I work with obstetricians who do understand the data and have the other derived information. We're trying to understand how we can fuse the information together to be able to do that. Jess, do you want to bring in the sort of policy perspective on this a bit? Yeah, sure. So I think the Prime Minister's mission's wording is how do we use uh, innovation data and artificial intelligence to transform the way we prevent, diagnose and treat chronic disease. And then I suppose there are a few things within that. There are the looking at the use of how you can use artificial intelligence in pure diagnostics, as we've talked about. But then there's also this sort of question that came up a second ago, what a Uh, algorithms better at doing than humans and it is that aspect of taking in huge volumes of information and working out the patterns now yes that does have an impact in direct diagnostics but also from our perspective in sort of back-end operational efficiency so where can we learn that you the more sort of mundane tasks of clinicians can be automated where can we learn to operationalize and maximize things like patient flow within a hospital so that you actually release more time for the clinicians to be able to focus on the areas of people where they really need care so i, th- I think we need to be quite 
careful in these discussions that we don't become too technologically deterministic. It's not necessarily the tech that's going to transform the way that we do those things. It's how it will enable people uh, to be able to do the sort of diagnosing, treating, working with people better than they can do now. So where is your main focus when you are looking at the policies on these things? Well, our main focus is on creating the environment. So I don't necessarily believe in that I can tell you, sit here and tell you which particular algorithm, which particular diagnostic piece of software will make the biggest impact on people, clinicians or the healthcare system itself. What I can do from a sort of policy perspective and what we can do as a system wide thing, it's definitely not something that... I can do by myself or the Department of Health can do by itself is create the environment in which these technologies can thrive, particularly so that they have, they're safe, uh, have a balanced regulatory framework. I think that's really important, that word balance. We're not trying to stifle innovation in this space. We want to support it. Um, but we also don't want to create an environment where we let something go rogue and it damages trust before this stuff has really even got off the ground. And um, so it is that creation of an openly competitive marketplace environment for technology where we're really focusing the policy at the moment. Paul, you've been working as a clinician in the area of ultrasound and so Indeed, forth, yeah. for, for quite a few years now. What changes have you seen recently? I and mean, Jess has been talking about ways in which practices could change, uh, time being released from some tasks uh, as automation takes place on others. What's your view on this? I, I mean, I could take an example from my own experience. So I'm a cardiologist and one of the the most commonly used imaging tests to understand cardiovascular disease is echocardiography, which is a form of ultrasound, basically using sound waves to look at the heart. The beauty of it as a technique is it's very easy. You can do it at the bedside, you can do it in the GP surgery, you can do it in remote locations. So it's used very widely. Um, but it takes a certain level of skill to be able to both acquire the images. You have to be able to make sure you're looking in the right place. Uh, and then when you've got the images, be able to interpret what they actually mean. So I think one of the really interesting areas of how technologies like these are beginning to impact echocardiography in particular is that um, there is some very nice work uh, being done by groups, including Elson's group, where you're looking at um, how you can train individuals to acquire images better. There's some very nice work being done looking at how you can take those images and within a few seconds you can get automated measurements from your ultrasound images that previously would have taken a cardiologist or an echocardiographer 10 minutes to do. And there's also really interesting work which we've been looking at in particular the last few years which is how you take those ultrasound images and look at what happens to that patient over the next year uh, and understand whether you can actually start to predict outcome for those patients. Uh, and using AI techniques to take those ultrasound images and extract novel features so you can understand which are the high-risk patients and which are the low-risk patients for future treatment. And this has been a, a research piece for a lot of the time in the last few years, but actually it's reached the point where it's actually becoming a real reality uh, in the next year or two that these tools will start to be available in clinical practice. I'd pick up on Jess's point, which is really important, which is that validation is key. So I think a lot of AI techniques are available. There are a lot of readily available software packages which lets you have a play at doing AI. The data sets you have are increasing. There are more and more data available. There's questions about quality of data. You have to make sure you train the algorithms right to handle the data. But once you've got that tool which you think is right, you still need to make sure that that's really make, going to make a difference to the patient. I think that's that's a bit of the area of AI healthcare which we're really moving into now, I think. How, how do you effectively prove that your new AI algorithm, which you think is predicting outcome and therefore you're going to decide what to do with this patient. You can decide whether that patient needs a new tablet or a new operation. How do you know that is the right decision? Historically, we've used big trials, you know, randomized trials. And I think we have to look at whether actually we need to do similar kind of things within the AI space as well, uh, in terms of how you regulate and how you move these tools forward. That really is an interesting area of debate at the moment, how you best design those trials. Is there a bit of a problem there? Because I mean, with randomized controlled trials, normally you select two groups randomly, give one of them what the standard treatment and one of them the new treatment and then see how they do against each other. With AI, my slight worry here is when you apply the, the AI, you are identifying people far more precisely in terms of their particular needs. Is that right? Potentially. So that, that's a bit where you have to, to clarify, I think. So you can certainly identify people uh, and, you, and you made make decisions on that. But these you have to remember these AI algorithms are looking for patterns in data. And it's very much like 
observational research we've done for many years. So you can look at patterns, you can look at associations in lots of data sets. With very large data sets, you're pretty confident there are really associated. But if you link a, a gene to a particular disease in association, you can do some statistical things to make sure you're confident about that. But ultimately, what you really want to do is an experiment to know if you alter that, does that change, alter the gene or interfere with the genetic pathway? Does that alter the, the outcome in a positive way? So I think hand in hand with what we learn from AI, we will need to develop proper validated ways of showing that we can get benefit for patients through this. Just to come back on that a bit, I mean, what's the appropriate comparator? Suppose you've got some AI system which is purporting to identify specific patterns in the particular patient's echocardiograms, and therefore you, you have some insight into their particular needs, and you want to test that against some alternative. The alternative, presumably, is going to have to be a specific diagnosis for that patient from a clinician, because if you just if you just yeah. say, well, the, the the alternative is just to give them a sort of absolutely standard treatment without any re- note of their particular individuality. So I think it's really exciting that it is possible to do that. So actually, I'll, I'll take it from my own my own knowledge of my own research area. So we have a great tool that, that works with Echo to uh, help us understand and interpret it quicker, potentially speed up patient workflow through the, through a clinic um, and provide a better outcome for that patient. Um, we think that works great, but actually what we want to do is trial that. So you can do trials such as randomized cluster trials where one center starts using the technique, the other doesn't, and you can in real time track what happens in terms of outcome of that patient. If the AI is improving the outcome, then you will see the rates of a particular type of procedure dropping because it's improving your accuracy and diagnosis, you might see, and, and you know, on top of that, you can then do health outcome analysis to show actually this is a real, real benefit and changes practice. Yeah, it's just to sort of come back on this point around the validation set and do you have to test against a human? I think if you are in the first instance when you are developing your algorithm and teaching it, yes, primarily you might want to test it against high level of clinician skill, but there's also what you don't necessarily just want to test the the algorithm, you're also validating the data set on which it's been trained. So from our perspective, if we are creating this environment in which it's openly competitive, I want to know if Joe Bloggs in his garage designed an algorithm that can predict hypo and hypo in a diabetic patient before I say, okay, yes, go and release this algorithm on the NHS apps library to the to the system as a whole, does that algorithm also work on a population that looks completely different to the data set that you trained it on, where you may have trained it on an entirely London-centric data set, which looks very different to a group of people in rural northern England. And it's it's that validation as much as the validation of the algorithm versus clinical skill um, that's important as well. There's another point as well in terms of what you're evaluating against. Again, it's not necessarily expert versus AI. So it makes good headlines saying AI can read better than the expert doctor. But we also know certain ultrasound, there's a huge variability in, on how you good you are at ultrasound in terms of different centers. That doesn't make it necessarily bad, but you're, there is a variability in expertise. So there's potentially value even in if, if you can standardize all the ultrasound you're doing to the level of an expert, that is a good outcome. If you can use AI to reduce the time it takes to do a procedure, then, then that's a good outcome. So that you know, it's not necessarily expert against machine always. There are, there are other outcomes which will add benefit to healthcare. I think that it is important to understand that a lot of a, a lot of the talk is about AI, this human expert, but this notion that uh, some of the bigger wins are going to be with this assist, assistive technology, which is another another way is to say it's the next wave of automation of machines, and it happens to be done in in a data driven way. And we haven't had that before. And uh, this isn't just in healthcare, it's elsewhere. It's the notion that really everything we're talking about in, in a class of AI, AI algorithms are supporting people in making decisions. And there's a lot of value in that. We, too, we hear too much about the full automation systems, which is, is a great idea, but actually the value comes from assisting people. Okay, and and one of the ways, perhaps looking a bit more towards the future, in which AI can assist, which Paul has already alluded to, Alison, and I, I know is an interest of yours, is the use of AI to actually train people to get better data. So uh, with, with ultrasound, as, if I understand correctly, the equipment is fairly cheap and widely distributed. Ultrasound can be done in lots of different locations. 
and, and the bottlenecks are both expert interpretation of the data, but also making sure that it's done well. It's a great technology that's changed with time, but it, because it still requires expertise, you often have people who are specialists actually using the equipment. Because of that, that limits the, the applicability of it to support medicine, is that you often will go to certain units where they are ultrasound specialists. And the reason is because of the difficulty of capturing images and interpreting them well and getting good, good quality data. So where the um, machine learning, the artificial intelligence can help is to try and mean that you make those processes easier. And if you do that, you can think about other people starting to use ultrasound. And that's not going to necessarily take any jobs away. This area is, is, a, is a very good example where there's a, a shortage of, of workforce who are, who are trained um, in this highly skilled profession. So the way it's perceived, including in the field, is that it will just allow the um, imaging to be used elsewhere. And in healthcare, that has um, potentially um, dramatic changes could come with time if you think about um, skills being moved into other, other departments. But that takes time. And as Jess said, you've got to think through all the consequences. If you could take an ultrasound probe into community care to a GP and you could think about the idea of diagnosing breast cancer, you could say that's great. But then you've got to think of the consequences of a patient finding out they have breast cancer in an environment where there might not be the support. A lot of people have to think very carefully about the implications of AI as a technology, so I can think about how, how I might develop a solution, but I'm a very, very small part of going from the idea through all the way to the implementation in, in something like the NHS. From what you say, there may be lots of areas around the world which would benefit from having people who are good at taking ultrasound images, not only in our country, but also more widely where medical services might be rather sparse. So if you can provide a cheap way of training someone quickly in such a way that they can take really good ultrasound images, you can then provide high quality AI software that's going to interpret those. This is a win-win. How do you see this training working? What difference will it make? Will it be that somebody goes in and, and uses it and gets automated feedback about how well they're doing it or What's the Possibly pattern? in the future, um, we, we're actually working in that in that space at the moment in, in global health um, ultrasound, and our approach at the moment is quite different. What we're we're doing is we're taking the low cost kit, we're simplifying how ultrasound is acquired, and then we're thinking about if you can just do simple sweeps of a pregnant mother, um, what information can you extract, and what and what can that information be used in the context of that healthcare system, so. Women in um, rural areas in Africa will go to, to any healthcare profession when they're very unwell and you don't know how many weeks pregnant they are and you've got to decide a, a quick pregnancy risk assessment. This is something that wouldn't happen in the UK because of the screening programmes and the care given to pregnant women. So the healthcare needs different and that means the use of ultrasound can be different. And so simple sweeps and then recognise breach, whether the head's up or down, recognise whether the heart is beating in the fetus. These are really valuable bits of information that in those healthcare scenarios are very valuable. So we're starting with that, sort of simplify the protocol that anybody could scan and then think about how we could do much more intelligent types of algorithm that would extract different information from today. Uh, maybe going forward, that might be useful, but in, in, in the UK, that would require quite a change in the way we thought about um, doing pregnancy monitoring and, and pregnancy risk assessment. And might some of the software actually give real-time feedback to the person who is performing the scan? Say, for example, you know, move the equipment in this way, yes, yeah. press here. Do, I, th I, th I think that's possible. And I think in ultrasound, it, you have the potential because you're generally following... Um, recipes, rules, protocols. So for certain tasks, you would be able to do that. Paul might have a view from 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 echocardiography, which is slightly different. Yeah, no, no, similarities. It, it, it's very interesting seeing seeing the similarities actually in in, in that setting in the obstetric ultrasound to what what I see in in cardiac ultrasound and echocardiography. So actually, the, some of the shift of how we're working within echo is this this greater use and availability of echo. So uh, some of the big hardware developments in in echo have been miniaturisation. So you can now get handheld 
echo machines, essentially, which produce very good quality images. And in some ways, they are replacing the stethoscope in terms of how they of their use. Um, and they're quite relatively cheap. So actually in A&E departments now and um, other assessment units at the front door of hospitals, there is a definite increase in use of handheld echo machines. As a result of that, guideline bodies have generated trimmed down protocols of how you can acquire, how you should be acquiring images. Uh, and so some of those principles are very applicable to those settings as well. So simplified protocols of how you image the heart, augmented with artificial intelligence to increase quantification, give some quick diagnoses, allows use of ultrasound in, in, and echocardiography, in particularly in, in areas which it hasn't been possible before. To come back to an issue that Alison raised, I mean, the, the implications of all this could be quite profound and difficult impacting on legislative issues as well. Yeah, well, I, th I think one of the interesting implications of that particular scenario is that the patient would, in other situations, have come in to hospital, the, the, the acute emergency end of hospital. Someone would have decided they needed an echo and they might have waited 48 hours before they got their echo. And what you can potentially do by augmenting these processes that we're already doing is you can bring it earlier, so they get it at the front door, uh, and you can get a quicker diagnosis in terms of what you should do with that patient. A few years down the line, you'll be able to go into a shop and buy one of these things like you can buy now a blood pressure monitor, right? I mean, is that possible? Yeah, so it is. So you, you can go on, online and buy an ultrasound handheld machine. Um, they're coming onto the market, a few thousand pounds, a couple of thousand pounds, you'll be able to get one of these machines. So is this, I mean, I can see a good side and a bad side, right? A more accurate diagnosis and far more diagnoses could mean that you're able to focus on the people who really need it. On the other hand, it might mean that you end up with a huge queue of people who've spotted some tiny anomaly. And no doubt the way one always gets these disclaimers, this seems to be all right, but you better check. <laughs> The sort of thing, you know, when you get a house surveyed and the surveyor will never actually sign off and say, yes, it's fine. They'll always say, yeah, but you better get an electrician to train to check the electrics because I don't want to be liable. Might there not be lots of people who use these things who then become more nervous as a result? So I think that's one of the challenges that we face. But, and this, this is true historically with lots of medical interventions and inventions. Very often when they come through, the concept is they're going to make disease disappear. You know, we have not yet come across intervention which has reduced our healthcare needs in the society. It increases, but the healthcare need increases because actually the benefit of that is because we're healthier and we're living longer. So these interventions really do have a real impact on human life, but it doesn't get rid of healthcare needs. There's still a need to deal with, with what comes up from it. It's a really, really interesting point. And coming back to where we started with this idea of training, I think it's why we have to think of this as a whole system wide. So there is training of clinicians, whether that be through how you collect the data so that it is in a standardized format so that the algorithms or whatever technology we're using can maximize it. It's also things like if we are talking decision support software and you're getting lots of notifications, there is design, there's training of designers as to what, how many notifications you give to someone before they start to ignore them and whether that actually then increases risk rather than decreases it through this idea that you're picking up the absolute micro sort of minutiae and there's a very big debate in sort of the big data world people have started to hypothesize that we don't really need to take a particularly scientific approach to this the data is the answer but actually when you're taking that big view and looking just at the data and not taking it from a, like a sort of hypothesized perspective, you are running this risk that you're picking up on really, really small signals. And that is a risk to the system. And I think people have been worried about this with like Apple Watch and that type of thing. But I also think that's doing a disservice to people. People have always had information about their healthcare, but what we need to do, what we have a responsibility to do is train people to understand how to interpret information that they are getting and to be able to be a little bit more critical of the information that they receive. If you are Googling stuff, how do you tell what's ver a verifiable source and what's not? But if we look at the wider world, yeah. there are a lot of people who are not 
particularly good at no. thinking critically about their sources of information. No, exactly. Are, are you just preaching to an educated minority who are used to filtering information? No, that is the risk that we would do that. And what I am saying is that we have to be cognizant of that being a risk and making sure that we aren't, we aren't designing a system in which if you have that skill set to be able to interpret that information, you can get better access to care. We have to be aware of the knowledge base of everyone and making sure that everyone has access to the right pathway of knowledge that is suitable for them. I think one of the areas we also need to face is uh, how we train our medical workforce to make use of AI technologies, just understanding those. So if you like, medical education is, is progressing rapidly, but actually a lot of what we learn about how you use a stethoscope, for example, to listen to the heart sound, there's a lot of focus on that. Whereas actually what we're going to need to do is as these tools come through is actually educate a whole group of medical practitioners to be able to handle queries from patients who have done a blood test or done their, got their whole genome for whatever through through a casual company and be able to interpret that and work with patients to, to make sense of that information. So I think there is still, there's definitely a training need within the medical profession to understand these AI techniques. And I go to conferences, which are great conferences, but actually AI is still in a medical world, sometimes just a, a niche, a side event, and most of it focuses on other aspects. Whereas actually AI is going to take over a huge majority of that conference very quickly until there's a need to understand that. I, I take a more positive view about the big data scientists. That is a, a really fascinating area. It's not at a stage where we start thinking about doing that in clinical practice but actually the the data sets we have around genomes are linked with medical data sets uh linked with imaging data sets a nice example of that is, is uk biobank a big study which is uh, involving millions of people over over the uk very detailed high quality data linking together and what that gives you is new insights so novel insights into different patterns of disease that we don't understand so when we talk about a heart attack Actually, there are probably four or five different things which actually make up heart attack. And we still manage it just in the same way. Until we dive into that data, we won't be able to make progress in terms of understanding how you might handle these diseases in different ways. So you think in the longer term, this will bring very significant benefits, not just in terms of economy and more people being able to do things or, or speed, but also in identifying new patterns that we wouldn't I think, otherwise have I think found. From, a, from a researched academic perspective, which obviously you know, we're in Oxford, that's a good place to be talking about these kind of higher blue skies kind of approaches, actually. There's a potential there to completely revolutionise our understanding of disease in some areas. So our, our classifications as you know of, of particular diseases could be completely blown apart and looked at in different ways, which actually mean you may have a whole new different ways of managing and treating these patients, which are going to be more effective. That is very much future at the moment, but actually it's, it's, it's the research is going on and we're starting to learn more. Just picking up on that, that requires you to build models and then work with expertise who are in the, that clinical area of clinical medicine, because some of your findings will contradict what you expect because you require to develop new knowledge in that area of the disease. And so it's very, very interdisciplinary, the future, about how you work together and where data science sits is how much does a somebody in the, the medical research, how much of them is a data scientist and how, how important is it to have a good knowledge and how far do you need to go is it to be a data scientist versus you work with data scientists um, much more at the interface of disciplines. And this is all new to us, I think, as, a, as an area. And I think there's a lot more to come. And as we get more into understanding more about medicine, we're going to have the deeper collaborations are going to be required. We can look ahead, say, 10 years on the research side, and we might be saying, well, people are going to be needing to do things in different ways because the technology will have moved on so fast. But over 10 years, you're not going to be recruiting that higher proportion of the medical profession. It, it's easy to train the new people coming in, but most medics will have been in post for a long time. They'll be older, and those of us who are older are probably a little bit less fast at, at learning new tricks. This isn't going to be easy, is it, transforming a profession? I think the medical profession is very can be very good at transforming and learning new things. I think for many years, you, you build up a, a set of knowledge in medical school, and then you you have, there's a turnover of th new things you learn each year, which is, has been quite a, a small amount each year, to be honest. Actually, you, you can keep going, but you can maintain your knowledge. But having said that, there have been big changes. So over, you know, I qualified 20 years ago. Uh, and at that time, the nice examples where actually I was taught never to use beta blockers in heart failure. Now everybody uses beta blockers in heart failure. 
And I think these kind of things do change. So you can pick up knowledge, but we do need to raise awareness within the medical profession that this is this is coming. And what about legislation? I mean, with lots of changes coming in, lots of changes in people's awareness of new information, more informed consumers, but maybe not always better informed and all these changes going on in medicine there's going to be a lot for legislators to do at the moment i think we are far more in the education space than we are in the legislative space we have to be aware of where the risks are and we certainly are as the department there are a variety of things that we've done such as publish our initial code of conduct for data-driven health and care tech but that's far more about the behaviors of the of the companies producing this stuff, then can signpost to existing regulation, whether it's through MHRAs, medicines, devices, regs. But a lot of it is how do we teach people, whether it's the regulators, whether it's those developing, whether it's commissioners, this is why I say it's a whole system piece to recognise what good looks like and what does not look quite so good and also how does what is in existence apply to them but the the really big piece for me around that where you say yes people are coming into maybe some good information some not good information is what levers do we press from a policy perspective around trust levels so you know i i could say for example from a regulatory perspective it is fine to launch an algorithm a diagnostic algorithm onto the system as long as it is 95 percent accurate i could say that i'm not saying that is a decision but theoretically you could put some kind of blanket statement like that out but i don't know whether that is acceptable to society so we have to bring everyone with us whilst we come up with these regulations and legislation we can't just impose stuff top down and assume that it won't have negative ramifications uh, everywhere we need to be monitoring that whole system implication before and bring people along that sounds horribly cheesy along that journey with us so that we are designing the system for the future for everyone those developing those delivering care and those using care Could I follow up the 95% accurate thing? Because a lot of people might be thinking, well, look, suppose if you've got some diagnosis technique, which is 95% accurate, or shall we say even 99% accurate, surely that should be rolled out to everyone. Now, actually, that's not true, is it? Because if there is some condition which, say, only afflicts one in a million people and you have a diagnosis which is 99% accurate either way, the number of false positives is going to massively outweigh the number of true positives. You know, to apply it to the entire population of Britain, you may have, you've got 60-odd people who've actually got the disease, but you've got uh, 1% of 60 million mm -hmm. queuing up wrongly being told they've got it. Yeah, absolutely. This is why we have to be really careful. I think this is a quite... Uh, polarized I think debate in this space as to whether we go really heavy-handed with regulation or whether if we do that we're going to stifle all of the innovation and everyone yeah. will run away um, we we kind of have to find a very we're walking on a tightrope trying to find the balance in between those two spaces because of all those complexities that you've just described where where we may have been able to make quite bold statements in the past I, I don't think that is in a space we're in right now and we have to be listening to academics to developers to people to everyone to be able to make sure that we're finding that balance that works for the system as a whole I think diagnostic accuracy is, a, is an interesting point actually because there's been an interesting discussion recently about actually our understanding and patients understanding of diagnostic accuracy um, and actually a realization actually we, we you know although we may be experts as doctors we still get it wrong an awful lot of the time we get it right more of the time but actually we do get it wrong an awful lot of the time at the moment we don't fully appreciate that i think in terms of our conversations and discussions so actually you know, because when you're talking to patients you have to try and present the balance but actually when you when, interesting if you look at patients understanding of what that diagnosis means they obviously they usually think that it's much more accurate than it really is and i think that is potentially a risk of of of, um, of not bringing on board AI techniques, which may give real benefit, even though the accuracy might not be as you know ninety five percent, because actually it compares very favourably to what you might see from a doctor or other. So there, you're saying the benefit of the AI techniques is actually to improve the accuracy so that it's closer to what the patient believes it to be. That would be one way. I guess there are other things, not necessarily purely accuracy, you want to to focus on. The other thing is how you balance it. So. 
you can set up tests to have different sensitivity and specificity. Um, and there may be debates about how what is the right balance for different tests. So it may be really important you pick up disease in some people, but accept that you're going to get a lot of false positives. That may be really important, but it may be more important the other way around in other stages that you don't you know, artificially create alarm. So actually that can be adjusted as well within these techniques. So I have a slightly different perspective, but it is sort of reinforcing. So as, a, as if an engineer, we, we take data, we use machine learning AI to build models. And what's really exciting is it's the first time ever we've been able to build models of the real world, meaning real world in clinical practice. And of course, what you find sometimes is that you are building models of things that are pretty accurate or very accurate and that model is 95% you can maybe get it up to 96 97 with your your algorithm but of course you also measure other processes that are maybe 78% 80% which is real world so then you can't use the 95% as the gauge but what's really exciting is you've built the first model and if you start with measuring something you've got a basis for trying to improve it and because AI machine learning's just happened really the last few years, for the first time we're measuring things we've never been able to measure before and building models of them. And some of the impact in the future is going to come from the fact we measure things, we find they're really complex, the, the, the accuracies are not that good, but everyone knows that that is still very useful for decision making. And the exciting thing is then how we build models and move them up and make them more accurate. But if you bring in the regulations that say you have to be 95% accurate, you're not going to be able to work on these harder problems that will probably have more impact in the future. Well, for me, as a, as a researcher, I like thinking about problems in that way. This area where I work in ultrasound, we have the easy task and we have the hard task. The hard tasks we know are hard. They're the ones that are not standardised in all hospitals. So you go from something that only experts can do. If you look across the whole of the country, you wouldn't be introducing techniques that were not, you knew were a higher accuracy and you could be introduced everywhere. But it, it's, it's the modelling capability we have that's the real power. Is there a bit of a tension here with the commonly perceived desire for transparency? And I'm wondering if, if here actually there's an important educational role. That is, maybe the only way of squaring the circle is to make sure that the public have a better understanding of issues like probability. Now, one could imagine that possibly having a negative effect I mean, with placebos and all the rest. Maybe the fact that the patient has an implicit trust in what the doctor says helps to cure the patient. Maybe the doctor coming clean and saying, actually, it's a probability measure. I don't actually know, but this is my best guess. Maybe that's going to have a negative effect on clinical practice. But I, I personally can't see any other way around it. If you're going to have lots of automated tools that are potentially available to millions or even billions of people, where those tools are being developed against the background you described, Alison, where Obviously, the people doing the research have to accept less than certainty because otherwise it just stops everything. But then you've got all these people with these medical indicators going along to their doctors and clamouring for treatment where there may only be an 80% chance that they've got the problem. Accuracy, as has been alluded to, is you get different accuracy for different things. So accuracy of quantifying something is usually pretty high. If you're trying to get an accuracy of predicting what's going to happen to someone a year down the line, it's not going to be as good and that's that's always been the case that you can put in lots of data and information but actually there's still the unknowns which are happening after the event of, of, of your measurement which is which you have to take into account that reduces the, those accuracies i think you have to inform populations education populations but actually um, you know a lot of time it's quite difficult to because people are busy and have time actually getting that information through which is why i think that touch point between the doctor and the patient is still valuable so i have patients coming in who you talk through information with, with them and you can judge in that consultation what is the right balance for that patient in terms of what they want to know. And and you you make sure they're fully informed to the level that they, they wish in terms of being, to be able to make their informed decisions about what they want to do. But there's a huge variability in terms of what people want to know. One thing you mentioned earlier, Paul, which I wondered might help here, you, you talked in terms of the tools potentially giving real-time feedback so that, as it were, you can, you can see how things are developing. And maybe if you've got improved diagnostic tools, then instead of jumping straight to treatment about where there's some suspicion, you might be able to monitor things over a month or two and 
use that to refine your judgment? So I, th- I think looking at longitudinal data is really valuable with, with uh, lots of these things. So look at how things change over time. And there are some nice examples in radiology where you look at things that you find in the, in the lungs, long nodules and things, and understanding um, if you have longitudinal data and watch what happens to those, you can pick up some which have characteristics which are going to get worse and some which don't. So you're right. So there is a, there is a process of uh, the machine learning process which you can do looking at longitudinal outcomes for different lesions, understanding what are the important ones to follow and what are the aren't the important ones. In cardiology, we do that with when people have problems with their heart valves already. So we in the clinic will see patients every year or two to keep an eye on what's going on the valve. Some get worse, some get better. And it maybe we can refine the way we do that and sort of change, change the pattern of follow-up for those individuals. Paul, one question that intrigues me is this. If these techniques, these systems become more and more widely used and cheaper and used in many cases by people who are not highly trained, maybe it becomes really difficult to tell how effective they've been. How how would we know? I think that's very true, actually. So I think um, introducing new technologies or new new factors in, into lifestyle, if it becomes very widespread, it is influencing outcomes already. So it then becomes very difficult to know whether the the change in, in the population, in terms of population health, relates to, in, in a good or bad way, relates to the introduction of some new technology or not. So I think this, this process we were talking about earlier, about really important to have robust validation and trials to look at how the whole ecosystem has changed by introducing these technologies is really important. It is, these technologies are very exciting. I, I think we need to press ahead and get these done because actually we do need to get the ones that work into clinical practice as soon as possible. So we're in a situation where opportunity outweighs risk. The, the opportunity is big. There is a real risk, but I think we can we can walk that tightrope and get that right. Uh, and I guess my point about speed is that actually there is a risk if we don't press ahead and do the trials and validate is that actually it starts to swamp across the healthcare system and you never know whether we've done a good or bad thing by introducing these technologies. Right. And walking that tightrope will be partly the job of legislators, Jess. I agree. I think we can we can walk that tightrope. I I wouldn't want to say we fall down on either line in terms of opportunity or or risks. I think what we are slightly talking about is this idea of a learning healthcare system where you can monitor everything in real time as to whether it's got better or worse and constantly reiterate uh, in terms of getting the regulation right. It really has to be, as I've said multiple times now, you're going to be bored of me saying it, it has to be coming from everyone. We've got to bring this as a whole as a whole system piece. We need to be listening to academics. We need to be working with the clinicians. We need to be working with people. And we really need to be building trust more than anything else um, so that we run the risk of not knowing whether we've made an impact. Yes, I think that is a risk, but I also think that we've touched on before this idea that AI is really just the next wave of automation. We haven't really touched on the point, the fact that AI is not particularly new. People have been researching this since the 1930s, possibly even earlier. Um, We've now only got to the point where we're talking about it and it's a big hype. And that is primarily because once things start working, we tend to no longer think of them as being artificially intelligent. And really, that is where our aim is with with the regulation, is get to the point where we are delivering those outcomes and benefits to people in an almost technology agnostic way. We've we've delivered the best outcomes in the safest and most effective environment that allows those technologies that are the most competitive to come to the fore. Thank you very much and thank you all, uh, Alison, Paul and Jess, for what's been an insightful and very stimulating discussion. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. And my thanks to you for joining us for this latest in our first series of Future Makers. Do get in touch if you've enjoyed the show or have any questions or suggested topics for us. We're on Twitter at Uni of Oxford. That's all one word. You could also leave a review on the podcast app of your choice. We enjoy reading all of them, not just the five-star reviews. In our next episode, we'll be discussing the role gender has to play in creating algorithms. And I hope you'll join us for that too. I'm Peter Milliken, and you've been listening to future makers.